This depiction is dangerous. Come on, ain't it? I'm cutting it. Good evening, this is Skinny E Media, presenting one of the greatest interviews uh, that I can even think of. And we have here one of the co-writers behind Censor, Mr. Anthony Fletcher. Thank you for stopping on by with us. Uh, hello, lovely to be here. Hey, more than welcome there. I know this has been uh, quite a bumpy ride going through this production, everything with the pandemic, and then, you know, originally started with the works it's around 2018 and 2019. So, um, yeah, we definitely have many, many questions uh, for you uh, for this particular interview, and I'm happy to have you here. How do you do today? I'm, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm uh, dealing with the summer hemisphere winter but apart from that i'm absolutely fine yeah i'm good thank you we're happy to hear about that there um unfortunately we couldn't get uh prana bailey bond with us for this particular interview um, she was quite busy with other commitments she had to make but uh we definitely got you on board uh, to get a slightly different perspective on how you approach the film yourself and um the first question i wanted to ask is in regards to nev olgar's character enid um, mm -hmm. The inspiration for her, was she more or less based on a particular person? Because for me, she reminded me a lot of like a Welsh teacher I had many, many years ago, uh, quite mannered and subtle in her own sort of way. At least that's what I'm getting at. Um, to be honest, no, she wasn't based, she wasn't, uh, her character, I mean, there's elements of her character which have to do with... Um, the censors, uh, a couple of female censors themselves who we uh, we spoke to, but that they're only elements. She's not really based on anybody. You wouldn't say that she's based on anybody in particular. No, no. I mean, I mean, maybe there's a, I, I, in fact, I'm pretty sure in my head uh, she isn't. And um, I don't think Prano had anybody. Uh, the other thing to note about that is, you know, she really evolved over the course of, um, several years as a character you know, like we, we had the idea of the person working in that office and and what what her attitude was towards the, the film she was watching but uh you have to go through a long a long process to really get to know your characters they don't they don't leap out of you so no no welsh teachers no welsh language nothing of that no i'm sorry all right then i wasn't saying just for her because i know she grew up in Cambro. Um, just from my own perspective, because uh, she definitely looked a lot like, um, this was back in primary, uh, Miss Quentin was her name. I know uh, she said that uh, she originally had the character in mind to be male, but then they changed it to be female, which um, I'm actually quite happy with. It, it lends an element of, hmm, you wouldn't even expect it, because I know most of the BBFC staff at the time were men themselves. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I know Enid had other names before, which um, I'm not going to disclose, but uh, it's like the idea that, that she would be have been a man, I think we discarded that really early in the process. I mean, if that was, you know, that was not... Um, I mean, you have to bear in mind, we, you know, it's, it's nearly 10 years we've been working on this project since we started to work on it. And I imagine Prano might have been thinking about it even before then. But um, yeah, I, I think pretty quickly we, we knew that um, the censor character was going to be female, not male. Yeah, definitely. All right, I'm glad to get that out of the way um, for everyone who's watching. Um, I probably should have said earlier on, on the interview myself was that I actually have visited the BBFC offices many years ago, back in June 2013. And mm -hmm. um, Ian Mashia, or maybe I shouldn't name his name, but I'm sure it may work there, maybe not. Um, he uh, was talking about how they view clips and the context and what ratings issues that were presented on board and how they have to um, comply with government regulations and also the guidelines that were put into place, which was at that time, 2009 to 2014, they do it in five-year increments. So that was a, one of the greatest days of my life. And uh, <laughs> that is one of the reasons why I love this film, in particular, more so than any other film I saw this year. Um, no offense to uh, uh, Forever Purge and Willy's Wonderland and Judas and the Black Messiah and Nomad Land, but uh, Sensor holds a special place in my heart. And uh, with that in mind, uh, influence wise, was outside of the Giallo sort of material, was Paul Schrader and films such as AMM, Taxi Driver, and Hardcore in the background, in your mind? 
I don't know. I mean, I, I think we we um, we had a very diverse kind of spectrum of films that we were interested in um, and that we watched and we thought about. Um, you know, not not you know, obviously that there, there are the, the video nazis and the Jello and the, uh, and you know the more classical to the horror kind of films. Um, I, I mean, I, I think a film we should mention is definitely is is Videodrome uh, by you know, which was a definite. You know, I think you could say that's a hands-on, definite influence. We watched that, and um, you can see elements of video drug in Sensor. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but you can see them. They're definitely there. But then, I mean, you know, another film that we really watched and, and in some ways influenced us, which, again, is using video, was um, Caché, Hidden by, by Haneke. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, like, and then, and then you go into... The, the the more obvious you know like um uh, Daniel uh, uh, Dario Argento and, and that kind of thing so you know there's there's a wide range of influences there um uh, so it's hard to pin down which one I think Shreda not so much from my point of view maybe from Pranos I mean we we both watch stuff independently and then we compare notes but I think I think that the video drone is the one that most I would pull out as being a really important reference point for us. I would agree with that too. Um, I know Videodrome is one of my favorite films from Cronenberg's catalog. I didn't yeah. when I first saw it, I didn't quite appreciate that much, but uh, over the years, I've seen it about uh, two, three, or four times, and it, it definitely gets better, especially with the sort of uh, knowing. I don't know if it's satire, but I would say it's sort of social commentary about uh, uh, media desensitization towards extreme violence and sexual content, pornography. Um, that definitely keeps people at edge there. And uh, the message still resonates even to this day, even if it's not so much evil, bad films that are going to corrupt your mind when yeah, you're I, I think I think the other thing about what Cronenberg does in that is he's really pushing the boundaries of what, you know, of realism, of naturalism, trying to go beyond that. I mean, you know, Cronenberg does that on a lot of levels. He's obviously done that. But, you know, like, I think that's... Um, the language, the cinematic language he uses, as as much as um, the con I mean, obviously the content has overlaps with, with censor, but you know that that idea of um, inanimate objects having a a life and being breathing and pulsing and that that kind of thing is is was really important for us. We don't use that much of it, but you know it, it, it's it's present and and existed in our the way we thought about where the film could get to and where it could go. A good approach to come from it from there. Um, there's many uh, great films and titles definitely influence um, Sensor itself. Because um, I know there's a lot of use of in film clips that were probably made um, by Prano and her team, Annika Summerson and herself. I know everyone likes to say. Hey, uh, here's a clip from Killer Killer, or a clip from uh, any film that I might be wrong. I'm doing the uh, opening montage, so the context of what it is. About the video, nasty culture, and thatcherism. Mm. Um, which even leads me to another point in regards to the uh, censorship and sort of social commentary. Maybe it's satire, I don't know. I didn't view it as mm -hmm. a dark comedy, but um, have both of you seen This Film's Not Yet Made or South Park Make the Long Run Uncut? Because uh, from my perspective, censorship is not a topic that's sort of openly discussed in cinema, not as least as I know in mainstream films. But this film's not be made in South Park, which is an adult cartoon that when I was up, when I grew up, I couldn't watch. I was like <laughs> it was six when that film came. I was, I was like, oh, so this film holds a special place in that regards because it sort of taps in that sort of you really want to see it, but you're not allowed to sort of element. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely that that whole illicit thing is really important, and um, you know that's a, a. I mean, I think it was. You know, we we always have this double thing. I mean, video Nazis are much more relevant for and, and significant in for Prana than they ever were for me. Even though I grew up more in that that uh, era than she did, but I think that whole thing of like you know when you're growing up and it, it, telling someone they they're not allowed to watch a film makes you 17 million times more desperate to watch that film. You know, it's like you know that's the way it is, and that's a that's a really interesting paradox and contradiction. So. Um, you know, and, and I think also there's something in there that the whole, you know, British BBFC censorship 
uh, what they were trying to do was was doomed. I mean, it was doomed. You know, they're like you know, it was it was they were trying to hold back the tide, and uh, there's something quite funny about that. We 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 watch a lot of those films now from the from the eighties, and we and we find them funny. We don't find them shocking. We find them kind of ridiculous and absurd. Uh, and so you know, like they they kind of started fighting battles which they were always going to lose. And that's also interesting, you know. But then, then when you go back to the BBFC, which we did, you talked about, you visited there, and you see the notes that they weren't stupid. They were really aware of the absurdity of a lot of what was going on. They're really kind of conscious of it. But at the same time, they did feel as though they had a moral responsibility for um, society, which is something that you know, obviously, in the film, Enid has very, very definitively as a, something that's important for her. She, she, she cares about the moral health of society and she's worried about it. So it, it's just that fascinating thing. Society's going to change. Like, if you censor films or not, they're going to change. You know, the, the history of censorship is generally a history of failure, I would say, you know. Oh, yes, especially when you can see uh, so many, what well, we would say, illicit tiles, like you said, but rejected stuff on these... Even YouTube and illegal torrenting websites, which uh, you shouldn't check. You should buy a copy of Sensor instead of pirate it. That's just saying that for the audience out there. Um, yeah, anything's pretty much open nowadays. I mean, you know, even someone when I was at university was trying to show me a clip of... Um, uh, th there's not going to be any censorship. I'm not going to believe anything out. A, a dark key getting fucked by a human. Right. Yes, and then a uh, really graphic ISIS beheading as a means of see this is what this is what these kind of people do. See, this is what I think. Now you even have that sort of dark web sort of thing that's going on right now with yeah. um, likes so, of uh, people uh, selling revenge porn and child pornography, which is completely illegal and horrifying to watch. Um, so yeah, it's a really nasty way in many ways. If the sensor can't be there or the film examiner, you're going to have to edit yourself. At least that's what I had to do. I even have to do it with my mother. And she's in her 50s and 60s. She can't even handle the level of violence that's in the, like an army. Yeah, no, no, I completely understand that. I mean, I, I, it seems to me that there's, there's two things at work here. One is if a crime is being committed in the process of filming something, then, you know, like the, the classic idea is of a snuff movie, well, then, then the issue isn't so much whether you should centre it, it's, it's a crime has been committed, you know. So uh, I, I don't know, you get into very sort of complex territory, but, um, but I would say more generally that, that the, 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 uh, when people try to censor art in general, it just doesn't work, you know. It doesn't work. Sooner or later, the stuff gets out, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know. So, oh, yeah, it, it never really works. Um, uh, well, I will say on my end, uh, film censorship-wise, when you uh, before you done censor and nasty the short film that preceded it, yeah, did you see this film's not yet made or South Park bigger along with uncut as influences or just like hmm, those are the only two that really exist? No, no, we didn't. We didn't see those as influences. No, no, no. Right. I don't think we did. No, no, no. I, you know, I, I, I and, and again, like I'd say, it, it's it's you know, like the, the approach is more. You know, it's not about a specific movie. You know, the, the specific movie that occurs is the fictional one that's in the film, which is called Don't Go With Don't... Don't Go In The Church. <laughs> don't Go In The Church. Yeah, that's what it's called. <laughs> like, I remember that. Yeah, Don't Go In The Church. So, so you know, like, uh, you know, so it, 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 it's specific movies that, that, I mean, we, you know, like, you know, it's fascinating, the BBFC, looking at how they comment on Ken Russell movies, um, which is something that really it, it intrigued me, you know, and the whole the whole palaver around trying to edit the, I can't remember what the film's called, but- The um, Devils. The Devils, that's the yeah, one, yeah. Yeah, they've got cut like a- You know, there's, there's like, there's like about, there's about a 300 page book written there in the, you know, like about what, and the cuts and what can be cut and what yeah. can be cut. So I, I think, you know, we weren't looking at particular films. We were looking at um, the general process of censorship rather than the particular process. That's what I figured out myself as well. Um, it's a holistic process. Could you cover also, you know, the 80s, the culture surrounding it as a means to escape from the real issues that are going on, exactly. unemployment, uh, the closing exactly. of factories, exactly. yeah. Falklands, whatever it might be. Um, 
just getting on to the next question as well. Uh, what was your first experience when you were growing up with film classification? So you were probably of a generation that remembers when UA, AA and X was around. I'm sure there was a sort of oh, like, oh, yeah. I want to see the X or AA film. My father was yeah. like that. No, definitely. I, I mean, you know, that, that, that an X had a mystique which, um, you know, attracted one to want to watch it. I, I've got to be honest, it's, I mean, I'm so old and it's so long ago that I can't remember specific films that would have been the ones that everyone had to watch right now. But, you know, yeah, obviously it, it, in, in, in putting that grading idea in, all it did was make people want to go and watch the one that, that they weren't supposed to watch, you know. I mean, again, it's a, it's a self-defeating exercise, really. And people found ways to watch films they weren't supposed to watch. Even then, before the internet, people would find ways to watch them, you know, like that was... Um, I knew um, someone who got a copy of Clockwork Orange and I yeah. believe uh, Natural Born Killers, while they were in uh, Los Angeles and they bought it all the way via customs to the United Kingdom when those two particular films were still yeah. unofficially banned in Britain. Um, they didn't come out on video and DVD until like 1999, 2000. And I always you know, caught in the corner of my eye why. You know, why is there this film that looks like Woody Harrelson with a gun? I thought, that's the movie. I couldn't watch it growing up because I wasn't 18 at that time, but I, I definitely knew on the corner of my eye, hmm, it's that evil movie with the people that say, oh, I was going to encourage mass violence and mayhem and hysteria. <laughs> yeah, so, no, no. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, yeah, I... Uh, uh, Clockwork Orange was it was Kubrick himself who took it out of so it's slightly different there you know he was the one who's banning his own film you know to think that Natural Born Killers was 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 banned it just seems absurd now I mean you can't how can that be I mean it's it's as absurd as you know like D H Lawrence um you know Lady Chatterley's Lover being but you know you read it Daniel what that what what, what was all the fuss about but um yeah. It's a, it's a, the yeah. only film I can think of that probably is up and deserve of being banned one way or another is probably like, well, I'm, I'm in, the, in public, so I have to be a bit careful about what I say. Um, you be careful. It's, be a, careful. it's a certain film from Eastern Europe that came out 10 years ago, and it sounds a little like Cherubian. You can yes. kind of. Yes, that particular title that was cut by four minutes. Uh, I don't want to see, you know, children and animals being buggered and stuff. That's, no, no, I, I, I've seen that on our side. No, I mean, I it's interesting that you mentioned that because that's the film that Prano, I haven't seen it, but Prano mentions as the one that made her think, uh, that made, you know, the, the first one that made her think maybe there's a case for censorship. I mean, that's that's the same film. She, she mentions that. I haven't seen it, so... Um, I think yeah, it's I, I know. best not to, so that way Uruguayan customs or uh, police don't knock at your day and say, Don't you have a video of the DVD on the DVD on the DVD? No, no, no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. They don't, they don't speak English, so I'm all right. I'm okay. You know, they're not going to find out. <laughs> I just, you know, just for your amusement there. So um, I'll probably get on some of the other questions as well. I know just recently, Sense have got a 15. Yes, yeah. a 15, which I yeah. was completely not expecting at all. How did you feel about that, you and Prano? Um, I, I think, to be honest, um, I can't speak for Prano. I don't, I don't know what she thought. I, we, haven't, we haven't really talked about it, to be honest. I mean, I... Um, I mean, I, I suspect my thinking is, it's interesting, um, I, you know, like, as a filmmaker, you, uh, you want to, your films to be seen by, by as many people as possible. And I think especially as you get to, um, you know, Pranos are quite a bit younger than me, but, you know, like, you, you want, you, you know, this isn't a film to be seen by necessarily, I mean, I don't mind if studious, you know, people, men with beards, stroking their beards and smoking their pipes, you know, that's not, you know, that isn't, you know, like, uh, uh, it's a film which is supposed to make you think, which is supposed to make you, you know, question things, but it's also a film that's supposed to appeal to, and hopefully does appeal to, you know, people of, of very different generations. And for me, that's exciting because, 
you know, so much of um, a lot of British filmmaking, to be honest, feels as though it slips into a niche where it's not going to appeal to very many people. It's not going to get beyond a, a, a very kind of narrow band. So, you know, to be honest, if it's a 15 and people can, more people can watch it from, from younger people, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I don't have a problem with that. That's cool. You know. Me and my mates on Twitter who often uh, browse the BBFC page a little too much than we need to when we should be working or taking care of our families. We were putting bets on saying, I bet Sensor by Prano, who we refer to as PBB or Gold Raider because their surname is Bond. James, <laughs> we, we were betting an 18 on this one, hands down. But when we were like seeing it, it was a 15, we were a little bit upset about it. But then we thought, well, I guess if a film like uh, Death Gasm or Hot Fuzz or Red Sparrow can get a 15, and those movies can get pretty violent yeah. and well, sexually charged. Then this film can too, I, I guess. I'm, Definitely, yeah. Because the meta nature of the narrative, because it's a film about a film censor being rated and sent classified by film examiners, it lends that sort of Kafka esque what? element about it. Well, you almost think there's another film to be made about who was watching censor and, you know, like, and how they judge that. But um, I don't think we'll, we'll make it. But, you know, like well, that's. We'll probably never know, but hopefully it's Craig Laff because he's, he's the uh, guy who sounds like that on the BBFC podcast. Right. All these. He probably would get a little bit of a kick out of it and said, oh, We can't give this an 18 or probably she would uh, send like a, a warrant for our arrest. No. That's no just... I mean, you know, to be fair, the BBFC. They were great. Um, you know, they've always been really supportive of the project. So, you know, like I've got nothing but, you know, they, they, they were really lovely. I mean, we, we when we first got in touch with them, I think we were a bit kind of like, oh, I'm not sure if they're going to like the idea of people going in and making a film about it. But they've been, you know, all the way along the line, they've been really supportive. And uh, so, you know, they, they just, just uh, you know, which is great, which is really nice. You don't want to be having, you know, causing problems with, you know, on either sense. You know. Oh, no, I, I get that there. I mean, Oliver Stone had to do the same thing where he met these uh, various names that he got for his research for his particular films um, to where he probably had to alter the names or not mention a particular institution, probably to avoid legal yeah. issues. And yeah. it's like, in the film, you don't say BBFC. Or British Board no, of we don't say BBFC. The no. census office yeah. was that for legal reasons... Did film force say you could get sued? No, but I, th I think, no, no, no. I don't think it was for that at all, actually. I think it was more just because we're, we're, it's a fiction. You know, it's not a documentary. And we wanted to move away from the idea that this is a documentary. You know, it's a fiction. It, they, 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 it's not real characters. It's not, it's not a real story. You know, it has that relationship to the office of censorship. But, um, you know, like, um, it's, it's a fictional world as well. I mean, it's in the 80s, but it's not a real, you know, like, you know, these, these characters don't exist. So... Yeah, I, no, there was nothing legal about that. I think it was just a, uh, a sort of creative decision on our part, to be honest. Okay, then. That's what I was just curious about there. Um, so I'll get to the next question in regards to uh, perceived satire or social commentary. Because one yeah. of my mates caught that scene where, I, I, I don't want to give spoilers, a person gets impaled by yeah. a particular item. He kind of yeah. chuckled that for unknown reasons. And it got me thinking for a second, because Prano did a short film called Man vs. Sand, which is very Chris Morris-esque, has that sort of blue jam, jam quality about it. And then, you know, the opening credits kind of reminded me a little bit of like a more fucked version of Brass Eye. Was that intentional? Uh, no, I, I wrote Man vs. Sand. That was a long time ago, and I wrote it. Um, that was the first thing we did together, actually. Um, I, I think... I think um, you know, like again, there's a there's a surreal edge to to the work. You know that that again ties in perhaps with Cronenberg is 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 the point of reference there. So, um, you know, like uh, I don't again, the, the, uh, you'd have to ask her because the image itself, which you're referring to, you know, is very specific and very clear. Um, I don't I don't know exactly where she got that image from, but. Um, but I, don't, I, I, I couldn't say it comes from a specific, you know, reference point, you know. Okay, then. I was just, you know, curious about it because, um, you know, I, I always pick up on sort of dark humour, wherever it is. I know recent years we had films like Get Out sort of, you yeah, play on yeah. issues of racism as a yeah. sort of trope for satirical purposes, but putting it in sort of a full of horror narrative. 
Um, and there were some moments here and there that was, in a way, like a more deadpan version of Chris Morris. But yeah, the- but I think I think it's really nice you mentioned Man vs. Sand because that's a lovely little film and it's a kind of quite a, you know, it, it has got that deadpan sort of a British surrealist kind of thing, which which um, Chris Morris had. And, um, you know, uh, and that is a strand of um, the work that Prano does and, and we do together. You know, that 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 it, that kind of like slightly offbeat you know, you're not quite sure what's going on sort of tone. But I think that's, uh, you know, to be honest with you, that's something that personally I've always liked about, you know, if you look at someone like Lindsay Anderson, films like If and Oh Lucky Man, that sort of thing, you know, like um, I, th- 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 there's, a, there's a, a a kind of quiet British surrealism, which I, I've always really loved. Um, and I think Prana does too. And so that kind of, that that is there. It's, it's very understated, but it's, it's there. And I think it's nice you pick that up. You know? Well, I thank you. Um, she's definitely one of great influences, um, even if she can't be here on board to talk about it. But I'm sure, you know, other interviews can probably explain her method of madness. Um, so I will say on the next question as well, um, there are two influences of the film examiners that Enid works with. I don't know yeah. the names of them that well, but I know that man who says about King Leon, Onshon Ondalu, and the guy that kind of looks a little like me. <laughs> yeah. And Danny, Lee's, Danny Lee Winter's character. Well, I thought, hey, why did put someone that looks like me in the film? I don't know if that was intentional. It had to be your best to two particular Completely things. intentional. Completely intentional. What? Completely intentional. No, we, we, we knew exactly what you looked like, and we were waiting for this moment. So that, no. <laughs> no, Danny Lee, Winter, Danny was cast, I, I, you know, um, the casting always comes, you know, last thing. I mean, you know, we always knew he, 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 was, he was the most sensitive and the kindest of the, uh, of the censors, and he always was, and he was the one who had a relationship that was slightly more um, heartfelt with, with, with Enid, and, and that was always the case. So, um, yeah, but the, the actual casting and what he looked like came, you know, that you, you write the part and then they take it away and they give it to an actor. You don't have anything to do, you know, that's a long way down the line. Yeah. Was, uh, my mother was seeing it on, on another screen because I was watching the video on, on demand. Uh, I, well, I don't like telling people where I am located, but uh, yeah, she thought, why, is, why are you in this film? And I said, I, I don't even know. <laughs> She said the same thing when I was in the IT crowd. I'm Richard Ayoade as well. <laughs> but that's just for you know, funny moments here and that. That was meant for her, no one else. But um, Yeah, I mean, it's a lovely performance by Danny, really. Danny Lee Winter it's, it gives it a tenderness, which is um, which is really helps because it's quite a tough office and, and he gives a sort of slightly different feel. So he, I think he captured the character really, really well. Uh, Perkins, you know, he, he's, he got him to a T, really, and, and he captured that kind of slightly warm-hearted, you know, slightly kinder element. He, he, he got it really nicely. Yeah. I will say also as well, I, I know you sometimes have certain characters and stuff in mind when you're writing, uh, but uh, between you and Prano, what particular part of things do you do? Uh, is she more into the sort of horror theme elements and you're more into sort of the politics? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, it's a, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, I, I would say in this film, when we came to write it, I always knew that, you know, the horror side, those, those all of that, she would do uh, a million times better than, than me. And, you know, like I do participate. We, we, we interchange, you know, I'll write something, she'll, I'll send it to her, she'll come. To, so, you know, she... Um, I, 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 I imagine that the the cliche would be that and that I would be, but the, I mean, the truth of the matter is we share very much the process. I think, you know, like, they, you know, she, she will sometimes say, why don't you go and write this scene? And I'll say, why don't you go and write that scene? Which, are, you know, like the horror seems to be more her thing and maybe the the office scenes were, were slightly more, but, but you know, the truth of the matter is by the time it comes out in the wash, you, you don't even know who's written what on the wall. All right, then. I was just curious about that because um, when I saw your name, Anthony Fletcher, I thought oh, maybe it might be focused on some of the more sort of political sort of stuff or that bit where the assistant censor says, King Lear, I don't know, it's on Sean Ondelou. 
I don't even get paid enough working here. I could be an academic. I thought. Yeah, do you know what? I suspect that was Prano. I don't know. But again, it's one of those things where we where we just, you know, this stuff gets sort of batted back and forth. So, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, and, then, and then, I mean, to be honest, I think it's, it's completely right to say we, you always, you don't know how many drafts this stuff goes through. It goes through drafts and drafts and drafts, goes through, you know, like at least 100 drafts. So by the time you get to draft 101, you, you've, you've, you really, it, it doesn't matter who wrote what in draft 32, you know, <laughs> you just, it just, it's just gone, you know. Yeah, a bit uh, exhausting there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a long, it's a long old process, you know, yeah. Well, hopefully we don't have too many questions for you, um, but uh, I will say the next one here for international audiences, because um, Censor came out, oddly enough, in the US and Canada first, before it came yeah. out in Britain and Ireland, which it's a little strange because they may not get some of the little commentary about BBFC and Thatcherism, but you know, America had Reagan and they had the moral majority and don't take drugs, this is your brain. And MPAA, they banned, you know, and censored a lot of stuff because it got an X, which in yeah. America is poison for box office. So what would you tell audiences who are from America or Australia, even France or Hungary? Um, I would tell them that uh, if you are interested in, uh, firstly, horror, secondly, the process of watching a film and what that process is like set within a drama that is uh, um, a family drama, essentially, because it's about, uh, you know, a woman who is searching, ends up searching for her sister, um, but if you if you if that if that idea of a film which comments or examines the, what the process of watching a film is and what you can resist as a film as 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 a viewer, then I think um, without without ever taking you to a place where you actually want to throw up, um, then you're going to really enjoy this film. That's what I'd say. All right, then that's a, definitely a good message for everyone out there. I'm sure. Allez voir, allez voir, go and see it. <laughs> Oh, definitely. And it also do see it when it comes out in cinemas in the UK and Ireland on the definitely. 20th of August. Um, 20th of August, yeah. Don't let the 15th certificate fool you. It is definitely a graphic uh, cycle, but, but it's not being sensitive, so don't get that out of your head. Oh, that's incredible. Oh, no. um, <laughs> and then also on another note, uh, yeah. so I, I, I am, from what I'm aware, you and Prano have a new project coming up. Things We Lost in the Fire, which is based on our Argentine novel. Um, yeah. Was that ever your intention? Or uh, did you get commissioned by producers? Um, well, um, here, yeah, I'll just, uh, I don't know if you can see that. I'll hold it up there. Las cosas que perdimos con el fuego. The things that we lost in the fire. Mm. Para, um, yeah, uh, Mariana, Mariana Enriquez. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're, we're in... We we were in. Well, I mean, I say we definitely. Prano uh, is uh, in conversation with various people about the next project, um, and one of those people and one of those projects is uh, is a company, a production company called RT Features, who have done a lot of very very interesting uh, cinema in the last five ten years, and um, they 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 um, I believe they held the rights to the book. Uh, to the to the story that uh, we got in touch with them, we contacted them. Prano did, and um, they they really keen on they love censor, so they're really keen on on pushing forwards and trying to make that you know the next project. So um, yeah, I, it's um like I say, the, the Prano's Prano. I mean, Prano is, is is in demand. She's got a lot of projects, but I, um, but this is this is the next one we're going to write. So that's I believe that's coming up next uh, that we're going to write that, uh, and it is a remarkable, it's a remarkable story. People, uh, Mariana Enriquez, uh, she was actually nominated for the Booker International Booker Prize this year in, in the UK, um, and she's a she's an amazing writer who who kind of combines a kind of gothic, slightly horror sensibility with a political aspect to it. Um, but also, you know, very entertaining, very compelling stories. So, um, 
So it's a really exciting project. It's a very, very exciting project. Yeah. Well, we honestly can't wait out for it. Um, we wish you the best of luck for the project to move on forward. I, I know Fano's uh, quite busy with uh, all the latest things that she might be popping up, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And I'll definitely do another interview with you when uh, the things that we lost in the fire eventually comes out and gets played at festivals. Um, I'll definitely be in the front lines for that one. Because uh, when I first heard the premise... Uh, it definitely reminded me of like a weird mix between um, a spit on your grave, MS-45, Nightingale, and uh, Revenge, Coily It's French. Yeah, it's got it's got a little bit of that going on there. Um, uh, and then but it's Nightingale, which you know, a few years ago that was very disturbing, uh, very powerful. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's also you know, there's issues like body horror. I mean, it's it's a it's a it, it, you know it's going to be a a very arresting tale, you know, when we, when the film comes out. Yeah, hopefully well, we'll see. It won't, well, it, is, it won't it won't come out for a couple of years because uh, I, I you know if there, it, it, with a bit of luck we it, it might get filmed next year and it would come out in twenty twenty three. I imagine if that was the case. So. Hopefully, with the Delta variant, uh, it will. Uh get up and running Other, otherwise we'll still have to keep waiting because of the cases of COVID rising up which is why I had to wear the mask right. and force people to still wear it even though Britain has legally said you don't have to so this is well, to you Boris yeah keep safe everybody I think that's the main thing you know, make sure keep, keep then, safe uh, the last question for the uh, broadcast here how would you feel if they made a remake of Censor but they'd done it about the Twitter compliance department and it was involving, uh, you know, Donald Trump tweeting out saying, go to this insurrection, still in the Capitol. And they made an America remake about it and then she's been haunted by the ghosts of her right-wing past. That would be a terrible idea if they made a remake of Censor but about that in 30 years' time. In 20 years' time, they need to do that now, don't they? I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they should get onto it straight away. Um, yeah, I, I'd, uh, I'd, you know, be, be very interested to see how, the, how they were going to make that. But, um, you know, um, I don't know. Um, I, I was thinking about a remake of Censor, whether that would be a viable or feasible or if it's too British or, or not. And it's, it's, uh, it's certainly an interesting question to see whether, whether they could do that, whether it's something that somebody might want to do at some point. Um, but anyway, those uh, yeah. are... Thinking yeah. about, you know, on the back of my head, like, oh, the Americans are going to somehow try to manipulate around this. And I thought maybe they could do about the Twitter compliance department. Because they often take people. But I think I think to be honest with you, Mark, you're touching a really important point there. You know, like you know, like that where I think you mentioned this in your questions, where censorship today is you know prevalent in our life as an idea is is very much with the use of social media and how that's um, you know how that's employed. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, you know, these issues are around that are present. Uh, is is Trump censored? I, I don't think he is. He's just not allowed to use a platform. He's got there are other platforms he can use. You know, it's like he's not been censored. You know, so you know, it's it's not it's not. So I don't I don't think it's quite the same. But but the issues around censorship seem to have gravitated as almost all issues in in modern life are to to social media and how we use those things. You know, so. I would agree with that too. I've uh, you know from corporate ends like you can't say about we're spilling um, gases and. Uh, oil into the waters and let the ducks and um, sea creatures die, or for that matter, government censorship, as we've seen over in Hong Kong and Hungary and so many places, just Tunisia, just a few days ago. And um, yeah, it's a pretty ugly picture of what's going on right now. Even Brazil, neighboring up there with Bolsonaro, saying that COVID does not exist. It's a hoax. It's just a common goal. Yeah, I, I, this this sort of talk about Bolsonaro. That, there was an interesting thing the other day that you know, like uh, yesterday, I saw that. Um, just on a slight side note, that you know, the protests in Cuba, which were, were actually very small, you know, got so much attention, press attention in the West. Um, and then yesterday, there was enormous, massive protests against Bolsonaro. I mean, you know, I think I think the Brazilians have had enough of him. They want to get rid of him, and rightly so. Um, but and that doesn't get any coverage. So you know, like again, I think what you get more than you get censorship is like now you, there you get 
who's controlling the media and who's controlling the medium and who's, oh, you know, what messages can get out and what messages can't. And that's, uh, you know, that's, um, you know, I don't know. That, that's not so much people being censored. It's, it's almost like people not, not, not finding their voice, which is a different thing. It's like, but anyway. I totally agree with you there. Um, it is definitely a really unsettling world to be in at this time uh, with the pandemic and all the uh, sort of vices people can make up at this time when no one's looking and everyone's thinking about Delta variant or uh, yeah. if Britain lost the Euro 2020 championship and called the black players horrible words because they lost. Everyone's forgetting about all the other stuff that's going on right now. Yeah, but that's the history of politics, you know. You, you make a it's wag the dog, you know. That's a great film there, which was made by I don't know who made it. David but Mamet wrote the script, I think. Um, know, that was um, who Barry I can't remember. Barry Levinson, you know. I mean, it's nothing new, you know. And uh, so um, yeah, that stuff's been going on all the time. But but yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's easy in a football phrase to take your eye off the ball and, and lose touch of what's really going on, what really matters. You know? I think that's pretty much the entire message that I got from the censor film as well. Not only for my own little nerdiness surrounding, oh, they talk about BBFC ratings, oh, they mentioned a 15 or 18 certificate, because that, that, that is the thing that you know got me all giddy, and everyone was looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? They didn't get what I was coming at, but um, yeah, that's their, their problem, not mine. I'm sure if they made a US remake, but please don't call it censor, call it uh, Hayes Code, which is MPAA, <laughs> where you could yeah, yeah. Uh, pre 1968. But uh, yeah, I, I hope uh, best of luck to you and Toronto, like Paul. I expect you to die, Mr. Bond, Mrs. Bond. <laughs> I don't know if she's a James Bond fan, but I just did that. I don't know if she is or not, actually. I've got to, I've got to be honest, um, but I'm not sure. Well, whenever, um, whenever I do meet her and I'm you, I'll give you a virgin Bloody Mary. Shaken, not stirred. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, um, Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah. All right. It's a pleasure. Like you, right? Hope to see the next projects keep on coming and uh, stay safe. All right. And you too. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark.